Well, good morning to those of you who have gathered here with us for in-person worship. We're honored that you have chosen to worship with us and to those who are worshiping with us via live stream. Thank you so very much for your faithfulness in joining us. Today, I'm sure you've already noticed these beautiful flowers up here in the chancel area. They are given by Miss Simon in loving memory of her husband, Javaya. And she gives them also, wanting us to know she is not only remembering but celebrating their wonderful life together. James Stewart wasn't the only one who had a wonderful life. But Miss Simon and her dear husband. And so thank you, Miss Simon, for beautifying our sanctuary with these incredible flowers. Also, I want to make you aware of something that we're doing and we've been doing since Easter. We're providing any, uh, a nursery for our children through three years of age. And right now we have some who are in the nursery and we are so grateful for that. But also, beginning today, if we have, uh, if we have any children who come in and would like to do this, but we're going to do it moving forward. Shelly Neeb is going to provide a Bible, stu- a, 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 a Bible story time for our children from ages four through nine. And it may be older, but we're providing that. And that will begin when I begin the sermon. And so I will even mention that. And then so if uh, Shelley will take the children and go over to the uh, preschool area and they'll have a Bible story time. So I want you to know that we're doing some things in faith, believing that if we provide it, they will come. And, uh, and so because we want our families to be able to know that their children are loved and cared for and also while having a moment to exhale and worship as a as a family and so i'm so grateful to shelly uh, for providing that also if you haven't picked one of these up please do so it is a new uh, directory obviously hard copy but Patsy Wilgus has updated it, and as I uh, encouraged folks uh, last Sunday, go through, go through it, and if you see someone there that, you know what, I've not seen them in a while, and we know that there are reasons for that for many of them because of COVID, but there may be someone there that you want to just shoot a email to or a text or a phone call or send a card or something to say, hey, you know what? We're missing you. We'd love to worship with you once again. Join us. And so I would encourage us to do that. Well, my name is Ed Cooper. I'm joined by my brother in Christ, Frank Thompson, who just blesses us every Sunday with his music. And so I'm looking forward to our time of worship this morning. And thank you for being here. And so now I invite you to join me as... The light of Christ enters our presence, and as the music calls us to worship. Thank you. 
Let's forget about ourselves and worship him. What a challenge, isn't it, as we begin this time of worship? I would invite you to join with me in our call to worship. How joyful it is to celebrate the good news of God's love. We are called to be Easter people. To proclaim a message of love which changed the world. God's love is poured on us by the spirit of the resurrected Christ. Fear, doubt, and darkness are overcome by God's love. Teach us to walk in your love and faith. May our love run deep and our faith true. As we offer our hearts and souls to you, O God. Amen. Frank. lead us like that. I feel joy and I feel happy. Need that. Well, I want to invite us to join together for a time of prayer. I know we all have stuff. We all have things going on in our lives and this is just an invitation to come together as a community of faith and to offer up those things that are of concern to us and those for those things for which we offer up praise. I would like to invite you to join with me as we pray for Ken Ellis. Many of you will remember Ken and Valerie. I understand they were just a wonderful, wonderful, faithful couple, family in our church. Ken's at MD Anderson, and so we want to be in prayer for him. Also, we want to, once again, we find ourselves as followers of Jesus with hearts filled with compassion, praying for the families of the victims of another mass shooting, this time in the FedEx Center in Indianapolis. We want to pray for those families 
and those who are who survived the shooting. And we need to pray for the epidemic of violence that has taken over our country. And then closer to home, we want to pray for the families of those who lost their lives with the Secor Power lift boat accident. So grateful for men and women, but men like Blake, who as a pilot, as a helicopter pilot, was out in the middle of that this week. And Blake, thank you. And thank you that you're home safe with your family. And um, just lives are touched by tragedies in so many different ways, aren't they? And we want to walk in a sensitivity to that, a compassion for that, recognizing I don't know what, like that father, the father of the young man, the father said, I'm going out on my own looking for my son. And he got in a boat and headed out into the Gulf. I don't know what that's like. But as followers of Jesus, as the people of God, as a church, we can pray comfort and hope for these families. So join with me. So, Father, there are times when we are just overwhelmed by what life throws at us and by what others have to walk through and experience and somehow manage to get through it. I don't understand um, all these, these tragedies, the mass shootings, the hatred, the love for violence, how human life means so little to some. I just pray, oh God, for a stirring of your spirit in the hearts of your creation, of your creatures. That we will see one another as children of God, made in the image of our beloved God. For those whose hearts are breaking this morning, we pray for them. For those whose lives are being suffocated by grief, we pray that your breath will be experienced, that they will sense life even in the midst of death. For some whose worlds have just gone completely dark, I pray that the light of which we have just sung will somehow be able to break through the darkness. And help us, Father, to be compassionate, faithful followers of Jesus. Being ready to do whatever we can and whatever you call us to do to come alongside our brothers and sisters who are hurting. And as an expression of our faith and trust in you, O God. We lift our voices up in praying the prayer that your Son himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7. As we continue a brief five-week sermon series on reclaiming our identity. I'm asking the Lord to give me fresh insight into just who we are as the people of God. What is it that we need to know about who we are? And what are we as the church 
in the day in which we live. And so this morning, in reclaiming our identity, I want us to think about a people who imagine a new possibility. A people who imagine a new possibility. From 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, if you are able and comfortable in doing so, I would invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's Word. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And all who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him, that is Jesus, there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As I said this morning, sitting here this morning, I, uh, my mind goes back to my mother when I was a little boy. And uh, the hallway, I guess, is about maybe 20 feet along or so. And she would just rub her hands when there was something going on, there was a problem, or there was problems in the world, looking at the news. And she'd walk up, on, up and down that hallway, and she would moan and she would sing. And I remember as a little boy, and peeping out the room, because when mama get in that mood, you don't do you just you sit down somewhere and get quiet. And, uh, <laughs> and get in trouble. And I remember one of the songs she used to sing. Uh, I need the Frank, I can see her doing that. I can see her doing that, pacing, walking up and down, groaning, singing. Lamenting is what the psalmist calls it, but yet in that hour of need, just saying, I need thee, O Lord, 
I need thee. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful spiritual discipline to walk and moan and lament while crying out, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. As always, my prayer is that God would use me in spite of me and that my words would not be a hindrance to his word and that each one of us, whether here in person or live stream, that we will be as present wherever we are as he is, for he surely is in this place and with us. This is a seldom asked question. I don't know if I've really ever asked it in a, in a sermon. But when do you think the liberation moment began or when the freedom movement began for the Hebrew children who were enslaved in Egypt? When do you think that moment began? Now, I know it's not something we've spent a lot of time thinking about, but stay with me. Now, according to Walter Brueggemann, it did not begin when Moses stood before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. That was not the time. Nor was it when after the deadly effects of that tenth plague, when the hand of the Egyptians finally relented, it wasn't at that time. But Brueggemann says that the liberation movement for the Hebrew children from enslavement began the moment that Moses went aside and stood before a fiery bush, removed his sandals, and entered into a conversation with Yahweh. And there and then, he began to imagine a world without slavery. There's a truth, y'all, that I hope that we hear, and that is when someone dares to imagine another possibility greater than one's reality, then lives and destinies change. Humans become more humane. But that does not happen until one sees a possibility greater than reality. You with me? Stay with me. It's very important to our identity as the people of God. You know, there was one greater than Moses who came after Moses, that one being Jesus He saw time and time again possibilities greater than the realities in which many of those whom he encountered were living. For example, you remember Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene, as a matter of fact, who was the first proclaimer of the resurrection. But remember how Luke described Mary Magdalene when Jesus came into her life, one who was, one from whom Jesus cast out seven demons. Now, I don't know what all that meant for her and what her life was like. It it feels like torment. It feels like devastation. It feels like being an outcast. But yet, when Jesus met her, he saw a possibility greater than her reality. And she responded to him, and it changed her life. That's the Mary Magdalene we know. Or think about Matthew. Remember Matthew, the tax collector? What was his reality like? He was despised by his own As a matter of fact, I feel certain that wherever he went on on occasions, he was spat upon because he was hated. His reality was he was a co-conspirator with the very people who oppressed his own. And yet, 
Jesus looked at him and saw a possibility greater than his reality. And Matthew's life was changed when Jesus said what? Follow me. I want to say it again, y'all. When someone dares to imagine another possibility greater than one's reality, lives change. Now, as for me, for me I, I submit that our realities today are similar to what Moses and Mary Magdalene and Matthew faced. But yet, they are dissimilar. For example, for us, materialism, consumerism, racism, sexism, nationalism, totalitarianism, they all seek to exploit, enslave, and exclude, while striving to devalue and degrade and demean the human person. We see it. We read about it. As followers of Jesus, we must not allow, as the church, we must not allow such destructive isms to silence our voice or to distort our minds in speaking and imagining new possibilities for others. Possibilities that extend beyond their realities. Now, what is the possibility that we imagine that is greater than one's reality? What is it? What is that possibility? A possibility that is our identity. Now, it's, it's something far more than, we've all heard this, if you can see it, you can be it, right? We're talking about something far more than that. Or one of my favorite thinking, uh, one of my favorite sayings is, and it just makes my wife gag every time I say it, but I love saying, I did a check up from the neck up. Because my attitude determines my altitude. Therefore, I allow no stinking thinking in my noggin. That's almost worth writing down and repeating sometime. <laughs> but we're, we're talking about something far more than attitude determining altitude and stinking thinking kind of thing. How did John frame it? We read it. In verse 1, and I love how um, Eugene Peterson says it in the, in the message. If you don't have the message, I would encourage you to get it. Have it on your Kindle or your iPhone on your Bible app or somewhere, because it is such a wonderful read. But he says, this is how he says what we read from 1 John. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We are called the children of God. And then he adds, that's who we really are. Now, it, we miss it in our English translations, but John really is expressing astonishment. It's almost like he's saying, what country did this kind of love originate? From which country did this kind of love originate? Because it sounds so unearthly, so foreign. How did it get here? And how did I experience it? You see, John's point is, y'all, love has not only been shown to us, but it has been bestowed upon us. And it is a love that did not come by nature, but it is a love that came by grace. The possibility that we want to express, to imagine for others, is that possibility of one loved as a child of God. 
Now, what in the world would silence us or get in our way or what would we stumble over that would keep us from sharing or declaring or revealing or offering such an energizing possibility? Think about it. A recipient of this marvelous love. Well, John nails it. John tells us what would silence us. Or what would cause us to stumble and, and, and not imagine this for others? A three-letter word. A word that we don't talk about much. Sin. S-I-N. But I absolutely love, and, and we all have our own thoughts on sin. I mean, what it is or what it isn't. And usually we reduce it to an act. No, when I was growing up, I couldn't play cards. Certainly couldn't chew tobacco. I didn't smoke. And if my dad caught me drinking, I'd be a dead young boy. And so we have all these things. Plus, I couldn't even dance. Got yanked off a 4-H floor for square dancing. Why? Because that was a sin. Now, I know that all sounds trite and all, but... You know exactly what I'm talking And it's no different for us. We've pigeonholed certain things and we say, that's sin, that's sin, that's sin. And if I'm not doing it, then I'm okay. But John has something far more to say about it. And I love what Bishop Michael Curry has a wonderful book called Love is the Way, Finding Hope in Troubled Times. But I love his concise definition of sin. You ready for this? Selfishness. A one-word definition, selfishness. And Bishop Curry goes on to say, hate isn't the opposite of love. The opposite of love is selfishness. Not where the sun is the center of the universe, but where self, where I'm the center of my own universe. He goes on to add that selfishness is the most destructive force in the cosmos. Selfishness destroys families and communities and societies and nations, and it will destroy the human race by lay, the human race by laying waste to our planet if we let it. And I will add this, y'all: sin slash selfishness will also create a loss of identity in the church. And for John, we read it. And I hope we, we saw this. For John, this is uncharacteristic. This is inconsistent with one's identity as a follower of Jesus. In other words, selfishness is not consistent with the life of a follower of Jesus. And I, I, want, I want us to do something for a moment. I want us to con contrast selfishness with the love that God has deposited within each one of our hearts. And it's interesting, these, what I'm about to share about selfishness, they're all manifestations of those isms, those horrific isms that I mentioned. Watch this. Selfishness excludes. Love makes room and includes. Selfishness puts down, love lifts up. Selfishness hurts and harms, love helps and heals. Selfishness enslaves, love sets free and liberates. Selfishness is the way of life. What's this? See if you remember this verse. Selfishness is the way of life for the one who came to kill, steal, and destroy. Love is the way of the one who came to give life and life more abundantly. Now, the truth is, every single one of us know a little bit about the realities of selfishness or the realities that selfishness creates. Our identity is to imagine new possibilities for others as a child of God, rather than being people consumed with selfishness or sin, that we are people who 
imagine new possibilities for others as children of God. Bishop Curry writes about when he was 13 years old, his family left Buffalo and drove down to Alabama, somewhere between Birmingham and Montgomery, to attend his Aunt Callie's funeral. At the graveside, a tall, slim, country preacher that uh, Bishop Curry describes as a black Ichabod crane preached a graveside sermon with his text being from Ezekiel 37 on the Valley of Dry Bones. And Bishop Curry writes and says, I can still hear the, the rhythmic sound of this slim country preacher's voice as he declared, Dim dry bones, dim dry bones, rise up, dry bones, rise. And then he changed and said, O oh, Callie, O oh, Callie, rise up. Callie, rise. And Bishop Curry said, We felt the power and conviction in our bones. We felt it so deeply that all eyes peered into the grave, expecting any moment for Callie to rise up and walk out. Of course she didn't. But my dear brothers and sisters, may we feel so deeply in our own bones the truth that we are the children of God, loved by God, and that we would dare to imagine a new possibility for those all around us who so desperately need to rise beyond a reality which enslaves and exploits and excludes, leaving them feeling devalued, degraded, and demeaned. May we feel it enough to imagine it and to live it. And as we do, who knows? Somebody may come walking out of a grave of their own making. That's who we are, children of God. Folks who imagine a new possibility. Amen. area and I know some have come prepared to give this morning and you'll notice on the screen there are three ways that you can give. One of the easiest ways is just take your iPhone and text in that number and then it'll tell you what to do from that point on. I, I've done that myself. That's not how I give 
uh, consistently, but I've done it just to make sure that it worked. And then also, you can go to our church's website, and there's a Give button. Click on it, and it's pretty simple. And then, of course, there are other ways that you can give cash, check, or like we do, through just through my bank, and it comes to the church. The need exists, y'all, for us to continue to support the ministries of our church financially. And I want to thank those of you who are faithful in your giving. But I know that we certainly want to be obedient to God's word concerning his tithe and our offerings. And I'm sharing this too for those of you who are joining us via live stream. We need your help as well. Thank you for being here this morning. My prayer is that this will be a, a good week for you. I'd love for us to get through a week without another tragedy. That may be a pipe dream, but I don't know. I hope that we can. Thank you for being here. Let's stand as I pronounce a benediction. And now, Father, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of Abba Father and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit go with each of us. And as we go from this place, may we go not only living out who we are, the children of God, loved by God, but those who you bring into our lives, may we imagine for them a possibility greater than their reality. They too, people who are loved by you, O oh God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ leads us out. May we carry the light with us. Amen.